All right, guys, so welcome to another episode of the Imperfectly Perfect podcast. Excited about this one, as I am each week, but everybody knows this guy. He is the face of the campaign, is a huge advocate for mental health, Mr. Jeremy Jackson. How are you doing? (laughs) Ta-da! I'm doing great, man. Thanks. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me on. You are welcome, mate. So like I do each week, I'm just going to go through a short bio and then we're going to get straight into some questions. So anybody that doesn't know who Jeremy Jackson is, lives under a rock, is an American actor and singer best known for his role as Hobie Buchanan on the worldwide television show Baywatch, exploded onto the commercial scene starring in dozens dozens of national network ad campaigns, including television and print. In addition to his commercial work, he starred in several daytime television series and films. He's also excelled in the music industry, releasing two full-length albums with two top 10 hits and several singles that launched him into a full European tour. His creative endeavors have been honored at the World Music Hall of Fame, and in 96, he was inducted into the Young Hollywood Hall of Fame. In 2003, he was established as a business relationship with Christian Ariege to market his new clothing line, Von Dutch. After the success of the line, he employed Jackson's talents to help catapult his new line, Ed Hardy. As the event coordinator, Jackson produced over 170 fashion events in 35 states and five countries. He's an accomplished Brazilian jiu-jitsu competitor, surfer, snow, wakeboarder, musician, DJ, and MC. <laughs> oh, mate, big, uh, big resume there. I mean... Uh, I've been at it a long time, you know, since six years old, so had a chance to accrue a lot of uh, life experience, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it into context, um, how we actually met. So, what is it, four years ago now? It's getting up there, yep. So, I actually, I, I reached out to you and I was like, do you want to shoot, mate? <laughs> and I was like, not really, I don't really like photo shoots. <laughs> yeah, when but I then I saw your work. Interview. I heard you say that in an interview, you don't really like shooting yeah. here. No, no. But when I saw your work, I was like, yeah, I'm going to shoot with this guy. And, and the rest is history. I mean, then the campaign came out, you were straight on board it. But I mean, like I do with this campaign, I like to uncover and you're very outspoken, which is what I love about you, about your journey. I mean, the first day that we met, you told me everything and you didn't even know me. (laughs) (laughs) I just love that when people share it. So take us back to the beginning, mate. And just like that young young kid, stars in his eyes, what you wanted to do. And uh, yeah, take us from the beginning. Oh, man. Well, you know, uh, from a very early age, um, I was enamored with performance, singing, dancing, entertaining from just my mom to her girlfriends to anybody that would watch me get up on the table and dance at a restaurant. Um, and uh, I, I just loved it, man. Uh, so I didn't know the entertainment industry was a business or my mom, you know, we don't come from a entertainment history background, um, industry background. We don't have family or friends that were successful or, or did any, uh, any entertaining. So we didn't really know what to do with it, but she knew that I was a natural talent and I, I would never stop. So she just kind of randomly by chance found the information for a child agent when she was at college. Um, we don't live in Hollywood. We don't live near Hollywood. We, you know, we're about an hour and a half away from LA. So it's not like we were in the epicenter of the entertainment industry, but um, she saw this little bulletin on a bulletin board at her college and said, child actors wanted, you know, and she was like, gosh, my kid's a real ham. Maybe I should call these people. Um, and I think I was about five years old at the time. And that agent turned out to be the same agent for the Olsen twins from, um, you know, Full House, uh, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. She turned out to be, um, you know, the agent for uh, Screech from Saved by the Bell. She was, you know, an agent for all the kids, you know, and it just was, was lucky that we got this good agent who was the real deal. And I just started auditioning for stuff, man. And, you know, started getting, getting gigs pretty quick because, I was a very, as you said, outspoken, um, even as a young kid, you know, I felt like a grown up in a little kid's body. So when I walked in the room and I was very professional and well-spoken and, and, uh, you know, it just kind of took off from there. Wow. So I suppose if you, if you go into that with, with fame, what a lot of people don't see like behind the scenes is like, 
when you was a young kid and you went into it, so I'd say like from the elite, the Hollywood, a lot of people don't see this whole like smoke and mirrors. On the outside, it seems fine. When do the pressures as a kid suddenly, or when did you notice them start getting to you when you saw the other side of that kind of the fame? Um, you know, it really wasn't until I stepped away, honestly, um, because, you know, it happened because I had a passion for it, you know, and I, I think, um, with anything in life, you know, if you're doing what you love and you love what you do, it's not work, you know, it's, it's your passion. So I was passionate about singing, dancing, entertaining, comedy skits, routines. I was passionate about it. I was going to do it whether somebody paid me or not. You know, so I was just doing what I love to do. And that was recognized by people that were in a position to, to hire me or to put me in front of the right people. And, you know, gosh, I, 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 when, as a young kid, I remember I met with Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, everybody wanted to see me. They wanted to see and meet this kid who was, you know, just out of this world uh, with, with entertaining acting and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was really interesting. Um, but it wasn't until I stepped out until I was kind of grown up. It wasn't really until I went into other areas of business where, you know, and, and, you know, when I was in the entertainment industry, of course, everybody, like you said, like you kind of alluded to and were questioning me on, um, you know, people want this fame. They, they think they want the fame, right? It's like, you know, I, people, uh, I want to be, um, billionaire entrepreneur or you know i want to be a you know yacht captain it would pick pick of career you know you don't just snap your hands and get the gig you know and people think that uh and and interestingly enough the industry has kind of changed you know it has kind of um taken a taken a, a turn uh, maybe for the worst in my opinion but um it's a business. It's a business like anything else. And it takes sacrifice and it takes dedication and it takes certain types of education and it takes time and it takes relationships and it takes, um, you know, it takes the same thing that just about anything takes blood, sweat, and tears, you know, hours of your life, you know, uh, sleepless nights. It takes what, what it takes, man. Um, and I think, there's this mystique that you, you spoke about the smoke and mirrors, so to speak, where people, um, you know, they want to be famous, but they don't want to do anything to achieve it. And, you know, fame is, fame is kind of like, um, you know, people think that'll make them happy. Maybe, you know, that maybe if I'm famous, my life will change. Maybe, um, you know, if everybody respects me or knows me or I have fame. And I think that's probably why a lot of people have gone to such crazy extremes, maybe with plastic surgery or with, um, you know, uh, doing wild, insane things on the internet to try to gain popularity or fame, taking risks. Um, but, you know, fame won't make you happy. Just, you know, like, like in life, being happy shouldn't be the goal because happy comes and goes, you know, fame, fame comes and goes. But if you love creating, if you love artwork, if you love the, the craft of, you know, embodying a, a different life and, and creating emotion from your own life experiences and, 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 or, you know, finding the way to mimic um, maybe a deceased uh, historical figure and really embody that. Wow. You know, what a gift that is to do that. And whether it's in a little school play or it's in a feature film, a blockbuster feature film really shouldn't matter to you. It, it, it should just be about the work. Um, and that's the smoke and mirrors. That's the mystique people don't get. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, guys like us, you know, maybe if we just had bigger biceps, then life would be better. <laughs> you know, I can, I can love myself if I just lose this, 
this spare tire, you know, then, but it doesn't happen like that. That's not the way it works. You know, you, if you're happy and you love yourself and then you happen to achieve losing the spare tire because you were good to yourself, supportive to yourself, you loved yourself, you took the time, you meal prepped, you studied, you followed other protocols, you, you know, you joined a a support group for you know people getting leaner you signed up for a photo shoot or a fitness show and you you know and then you did it and then you'd have it then you probably are going to keep it or actually enjoy it because that was just icing on the cake you were already passionate and deeply involved and loving yourself first you know yeah. it's like learn to enjoy that process as you're going but know that there is a process there and you don't just go from a to z yes and the process more often than not, just like with anything in life, um, has a lot of cost. There's reward, but there's a lot of cost. You know, I think as humans, we can achieve anything we want, absolutely anything. But keep in mind, you know, at what cost. Mm. Totally true. And then when, when you move forward and then Baywatch came along, were you guys what's the word say say blown away at the response and how big it actually went and then obviously more pressures of fame because you've got paparazzi you've got all this this huge huge attention on one show for a young kid as well how how did you i mean even from david and, and pamela from that age to your age were you all kind of blown away how fast and big it grew you know you got the night rider on the show you you kind of know it's not going to fail you know <laughs> you you kind of know it's going to do good he's already he's a big deal you know you got all these beautiful people on the beach you know did we know it was going to be the most watched television show in the history of the world and be in Guinness Book of World Records no um you know were there their scares related to ratings and and how we were doing and if we were going to make it to another season yes um, but I wouldn't say there was, uh, there was much, uh, you know, I, I've always been, you know, I got my set of issues and I, and one of my strengths is that I've just always been an optimist. You know, I've always, I've always, you know, I, I might torment myself. I might beat myself up. I might be hard on myself. I, I might not appreciate what I have in the moment or, you know, think that, you know, something outside of me is going to make it better. Um, but I've always been an optimist. And so, you know, I really did kind of just enjoy the process and, and uh, have fun. The, the set, you know, summertime, you know, we're on the beach. Yeah, paparazzis all want to get a picture, you know, stay in shape, eat good lunch, um, jump in the ocean at, uh, on break. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't too stressful on set, really. I mean, there, were, there was a lot of demand to show up and perform and do your job well. You know, we're on a crunch. You got to get the shot. You know, we're losing the sunlight. Those were the kind of stressful things. Hurry up. You know, it's got to – now we got to relight and make it look like day. Sometimes we'd shoot in the night and then make it look like day, you know. Um, so production was stressed, but I pretty much just had a good time, man. Wow. And I know we've often spoke about it because it's something that we've both got in common when it comes to the working out and then in the past body dysmorphia. When you're on a show that's based on aesthetics, I mean, I've spoken to another couple of cast members, as you know, and, and they said the same thing. People don't realize you have to train and that's a mental upheaval as well because you're on a show that's like world renowned. And right. Peak condition. Well, you know, the pressure was a little different for me because I was a kid, right? So I didn't have to be in shape. Of course, they don't want you getting chubby. And there were some times when the producers would be, hey, you know, you're, you're getting, a little, uh, getting a little belly there, which is totally not okay to say to a 14-year-old kid. It's something not a 14-year-old kid should be thinking about, right? But, um, you know, it definitely made an impact on me for the rest of my life and, you know, what – uh, I think is necessary to be successful, to be loved, to be seen as, um, you know, victorious, to be seen as a sex symbol, to be appreciated and needed. 
So yeah, I mean, being in great shape or trying to be in great shape or getting back in shape has been a reoccurring theme in my life because, you know, you got David Chokichi, you got David Charvet, you got Jason Momoa, <clears throat> Jason Simmons, all these guys are lean and mean and, and obviously people are throwing money at them. They're getting yeah, the hot girlfriend. So as a, in your formative years, seeing that all the time, it's kind of maybe impossible to beat that out of your head as an adult, right? Yeah. <laughs> It, oh man, just yeah, just going into that. And I know we've often spoken about it, but um, moving on, you you're into all your mindfulness and, and breath work and that, and that comes from you being openly spoken about your past with that fame, and then what happens when you're partying. I mean, I remember the first time we were talking, and you were saying, "Yeah, I got into a bad stage where I was partying." And can you remember when I said, "Yeah, Jeremy, I used to party," and you was like, "No, Glenn, I used to party," and I was like, "Yeah, I partied," and you were, "No, Glenn, I." <laughs> I was, and then you told me and I was like okay maybe I've not parted <laughs> but right. yeah but I love the way that you you share that story and you're open about it and you've come through recovery and now you use your platform to be a mentor to others and I know when we came to LA and we was at yours and we did that for rehab 9-11 to I think a, a, a cross average of nine million people and yeah that was sharing your story with that man it's um, yeah Amazing. But thank you for doing that with me, man. That was, that was a really cool time. Um, I, I, I deeply enjoyed that and, and it was great to, to be able to do it with you. Um, and you know, I, I consider myself to be one of the very lucky, um, unfortunately few, um, people who suffer with a mental uh, disorder and a, a obsession of the mind and a, an allergy of the body and, and, what we call a spiritual disease, you know, um, it's, it's a disease of the mind, but there's a spiritual sickness that goes with it, you know? And, um, and many people, the majority uh, of people who are hooked on drugs never get the opportunity to realize that drugs in any way, shape or form, um, can't be taken, you know? Um, there's, there's so much rationalization and justification that go along with it. You know, just a beer, um, only wine or at my cousin's wedding, you know, there's so many excuses and exceptions that come up. Oh, it's prescribed by a doctor. And, you know, now with prescription drugs being so heavily prescribed, you know, a lot of people are overly medicated and, you know, they, they might stay away from the hard stuff, but they still have a, an addiction that, uh, you know, they can't get off and it's still hindering the, their freedom, the way they live and to get into some of the deeper work, the deeper spiritual work to uncover and discover the, the, the reason why there needs to be this shell or this, this veil or this shield around you, why your heart is hurting and there needs to be some sort of lubricant between me and the world, which um, for people with my particular mental disorder uh, among various other ones um, is that somehow a, a drink or some form of a drug is going to help me fit in more is going to help me feel more a part of. Um, and luckily, you know, I've, I've made the mistake enough times to, to learn that every time I touch the stove, it's hot. You know, every time I put my hand in the fire, I get burned. Uh, and I've tried every form of sticking my hand in the fire uh, that you can think of. I've had managers, agents, millions of dollars, rich girlfriends, perfect body. Um, I've had, you know, uh, everything that you would think a person could achieve, you know, to, to be set apart or to be protected or to be different or to make it out unscathed. And, uh, you know, I, I tend to get scathed more than most, it seems. And that's a blessing and a curse. So I've learned that, uh, yeah, for me, just no drugs and no alcohol. And, you know, that doesn't, um, that doesn't fix the problem, you know, um, because drugs and alcohol are not my problem. It's the stuff that goes on between my ears. That's a problem. And if I don't address that, then, then I'm either going to be off drugs and alcohol and selfish, dishonest, ashamed, afraid, self-seeking, um, you know, 
ambitious for the wrong reasons in the wrong direction. You know, if I continue to live my life based on the traumas and the, the, um, the hurts that, that, you know, just will take like growing up on Baywatch, growing up in front of perfect bodies. And if I just continue to live my life believing or placing all bets on, if I have a six pack, then I can be successful. And that's all I'm focused on. Just look at all the other opportunities I'm missing out on. There's so many other, but I'm hyper-focused on that because that was my upbringing. That's how, you know, that's the, the trauma that I, that I lived through. That, that was my life. That was my experience then. And that was then. It's not now, right? And you can't just ignore it and it goes away. You have to address it and you have to address it with each person. We're talking specifically specifically about alcoholism and drug addiction in, in, for me right now. But I do believe that this process that we're going to talk about a little bit can be used by anybody for anything. They're, they're, through spiritual work, through meditation, through self-examination, through historically combing through your past, through looking at relationships, right? So, you know, um, one of the processes that's helped me the most is, you know, let's, let's say Baywatch. Okay. Let's take Baywatch. Like it was great, but also bad. You know, I got beat up at school from it. I, I was lied to, manipulated, stolen from because of it, conned because of it. I was taken advantage because of it. I didn't have a proper upbringing because of it. I didn't go have friends or get to go to normal school. Um, you know, the girls that dated me or went after me only wanted to go after me probably, you know, many times to make an ex-boyfriend jealous. Okay, well, I'll date the famous guy, right? Um, or, or uh, you know, they were just looking for notoriety and or fame or thinking maybe that a famous guy will be the answer to their problems. Or if they get pregnant by me, you know, they'll be set for life, you know, and I'm like 16. So there's good stuff and there's bad stuff, right? So we take Baywatch and I have these feelings about Baywatch, like Baywatch, like if, how would my life have been if I never was on Baywatch? Would, would it have been, would it have been better? You know, would it have been worse? You know, would I, not have made these poor choices, but I not have gone on drugs. I don't know, but there's feelings from it. Right. And these are feelings that stay with you for life. Right. And feeling from past experiences shouldn't have to stay with you for, for life. There's lessons in them. You know, you're supposed to you, educate, grow, you know, improve, fine tune and, and, and let go of the bad stuff. But that bad stuff seems to stick. Right. So there's a process here of, of letting go through um, discarding old emotional inventory, right? Um, every business takes inventory. You don't just leave old junk on the shelf that's going expired. That's not good for business, right? You have to go in there. What do you have left? What do you need to discount? What do you need to throw away? It's a, it's a regular practice in any successful business, right? Um, so there's this inventory you go through it. You find things like this. It could be a relationship. It could be a mistake that I made. It could be a horrible thing. You know, oh, but you don't understand. I, you know, <clears throat> I was drunk driving and I crashed and this person was injured. And, I, you know, it could be anything you know, from the most horrific to, to mild. And, and we don't really know. You know, was it good? Was it bad? I don't know. But I still kind of, eh, I'm not sure. You look at this situation and, and you, you, what was it? It was Baywatch, right? What did Baywatch? Well, it stole my childhood and, you know, sure it made me money, but you know, they, you know, I, they fired me or I walked away and they didn't rehire. There's all these little intricacies, right? And that, what did that affect? That it affected areas of my life, right? And there's certain areas of life that, that we use specifically for this practice. Namely, self-esteem. So I have to say, did Baywatch affect my self-esteem? What is self-esteem? You know, self-esteem is self-esteem 
is for this particular practice, the character that I have assigned myself in this situation, the role, what was my role? So if I look at it like, uh, you know, Baywatch, like, not, you know, I, I can never get away from it. I'm always going to be the guy from Baywatch. You know, how does that affect the role that I've assigned myself? Well, today, right now, the role you know, I've assigned myself is I just want to be like a happy, healthy guy. I want to be a regular guy. I want to connect to my fellows. I want to be a voice for, for purpose and I want to inspire people. And, you know, um, I don't always, I just, I don't just want, I'm more than the guy from Baywatch. Like you don't understand. Like I have other talents too. I have other skills too. So did that affect the role that I've assigned myself? Heck yeah. Self-esteem check, you know, made it, really good and it made it really bad oh i'm oh i'm famous i'm better than everybody oh i'm not famous anymore i'm a piece of shit holy crap yeah baywatch affected my self-esteem and then the next one you look at is self-esteem pride right pride did it affect my pride pride for this particular exercise is the way I expect to be treated? No. I have, the, I have my notes somewhere. I'm, I'm going through this thing. It's one of the most freeing things I've ever done. Uh, tried. It's something about the, it's something about the way I expect to be treated, right? Is, is the, what I, how I need people to view me, right? Mm -hmm. Did it affect the way I need people to view me to be okay? And they say, I have to ask yourself, yeah, yeah, well, they, yeah, everybody sure did. They, 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 uh, often people thought I was lying to them because I was an actor and they didn't know about actors. They didn't know whether to believe me if they were, I was caught, um, um, you know, then when, so when I was on Baywatch and famous, it's like people treated me really weird, like is this guy saying this because he thinks he's cooler than me? Uh, is he, you know, I just am trying to be a normal guy connecting to friends and people are making assumptions based on um, me having an ego, thinking I have an ego. Then when you're not on Baywatch anymore, you know, how I expect to be treated, people, oh, people calling me washed up, you know, people, you know, you know, you, has been all this kind of stuff. So yeah, sure. Affected my pride, right? My ambition. And for this practice, my ambition, did it, did Baywatch affect my ambition? My ambition is what I need out of this situation to be okay. Same rules apply. Did, is what I need out of this to be okay affected? Yeah. Well, it, it gave a lot. It took a lot. It was up and it was down. Um, now it's not around anymore. And you can, you, you kind of fine tune and you go into these, these areas and you write all this stuff down. This is all a written assignment. So yeah. Ambition down to personal relationships, my deep seated idea of what a relationship like this should look like. Yes, I feel somewhat betrayed. I felt rewarded. Now I felt betrayed. You know, David Hasselhoff is super rich. Why didn't he take better care of me? I didn't have more when I didn't have, you know, all into all this stuff. There's so much stuff, right? Sexual relations, pocketbook, um, pride, self-esteem, pride, ambition. Go down this list of these, uh, the, these, seven areas of self they're called the seven areas of self um and you and you make these notes did it affect my pocketbook yeah so when you look at just these three baywatch what happened and what areas of self it affected the character I wanted to portray to the world, the things I expected, the relationship it affected, the sexual relations, how it affected my, can you imagine how it affected my sexual relations? We didn't even get to that. My deep seated idea of what a real man or a real woman would do in this situation. You know, you get into that, wow, wow, wow. Oh my gosh. All these realizations, holy crap. Then you get into how I handled it. So we know it was Baywatch that caused a lot of emotion for me, good and bad. Then we know what Baywatch did, the good and bad, right? And we know the seven areas of self that it affected and how it applied to, 
to my idea of what a real man, what my ambition, my pride, my self-esteem, you know, my pocketbook, my sexual relations and my personal relations. And then what did I do? What was the action that I took? First, the action, my action. Well, I did kind of mess up and get on drugs and ruin it. I walked away from the show. Okay. And you get down to what was the thought that I had that allowed me, how was I thinking that allowed me to take that action? Well, I was thinking I'm rich. I'm better than this show. Everybody needs me. People want me. I can go do another show. I'll just go do another movie. I don't care. I'm a teenager. Fuck that show anyway. You know, there's thoughts I was having. I make note of all those thoughts. Now, what was the fear that I had that allowed me to think in that way that allowed me to take that action? Okay. So, oh man, really, if I'm honest right now, the fear, the fear I had was that at the time when I quit the show, when I was 18 is because Baywatch was very much so interrupting with my party. It was very hard to, to, to get my crap together and show up to work. And it was also very worrisome that they were going to figure it out, that they were going to find out. So really I was afraid they were going to find out, right? That I was on drugs. So it allowed me to think in an egotistical way that I was too good for them. That allowed me to take the action of quitting the show. Sure. There was bad stuff going on, but, but really I had this fear that led to these thoughts that led to this action. And then after fear, you say, who did it harm? Who was harmed? So then I start making this list of everybody that was hurt by my fearful thinking that led to action. So I'm like, oh man, my, my, my mom, my sister, my grandma, all my girlfriends. I mean, uh, my, my, my rehabs, doctors, lawyers. I mean, I drug hundreds, if not thousands of people into my shit storm life based on fear that allowed me to think certain things that allowed me to take certain actions that man allowed me to mess everything up and thinking that they were the problem. Everybody else was the problem. If they didn't do this, if they didn't say that, if the show wasn't like this, if all the producers weren't hooking up with chicks, then maybe I wouldn't, you know, all of these excuses to allow me to be the victim. I'm the victim. I'm the, but you don't understand. I was just a poor kid. No, I had unhealthy. I had lies that allowed me had un, unhealthy thoughts that allowed me to take action, which ultimately hurt many, many, many people. So after I now have suddenly realized that most of this stuff is my fault, that the world is going to work how it's going to work, that people are going to do what they're going to do. Everybody's just trying to do the best they can with the tools they have, with their own set of life experiences, with their own hurts and their own traumas, their own lies, their own fears, right? Their own insecurities, their own jealousy, their own greed. But this is about me, right? How can I operate in this crazy world without being a victim all the time to other people who have completely different set of shit I don't even freaking know about, right? So then that's a big realization. Wait a minute. When I'm unhealthy, when I'm fearful, when I'm thinking crooked, when I'm, my thinking is crippled by fear, I eventually hurt a lot of people. I drag my family and my friends through the mud financially, you know, and everybody's got to hear my problems. You know, everybody's got to try to fix it real quick. Hurry up. Let's fix, you know, let's rally and fix Jeremy's life and put him back together. He's broken again. That's a scary thing. Wow. That's a lot of responsibility. I better keep my shit in check up here because I don't want to drag everybody through the mud for the rest of my life. And then 
lastly, after I've had these realizations, I, lastly, I say, well, perhaps, like I said, perhaps those people weren't perfect either. You know, perhaps, well, maybe they had their own family issues. Maybe they had their own addictions. Maybe they had their own, um, you know, their, their own obsessions. Maybe they have their own mental issues, life issues, family issues that they're dealing with. And I, I say a little prayer for those people and, and I forgive those people. And, and, and I realize that whatever, whatever fingers I have pointing at anybody have three pointing back at me. So I'll take, I take out the mirror and I put away the microscope because it's real easy to focus on everybody else, right? And blame and judge or just be a pinball in life bouncing around between all of these people who they don't know how you feel. They don't understand. They probably never will because it's my experience, right? And, and it's my set of life circumstances. And, but taking ownership of those and, and finding how I can operate free from the bondage of my own fears and worries and doubts is like, the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me. And it's a new process that I've been going through and applying to every situation in my life. And it's allowed me to just kind of love and accept and look for places where I can be useful and beneficial to other people. And by looking for those opportunities, I'll just pull over. I see a lady with her, with her hood open. I pull over right away. Boom. Screw what I'm doing. I'll be late to my appointment. Boop, boop. Ma'am, can I help you? Do you need, you know, do you need anything? And um, the more I can focus on being of service to others, being used by God, being used by source, the spirit of the intellect of the universe, the greater good, the, the, the positive energetic flow, um, the less I worry about me, the less I think about me, and the less I am, am tormented by the stuff up here. So I know I just went on a crazy tangent right now, but I figured it was worth a shot. You know what though, mate, that, and this is what I, each time we catch up or I, we chat, and this is what I absolutely love about you because you go deeper on yourself each time we talk. And I could listen to you for hours. And I think there's so much to unpack there for people who are listening to this episode because, mate, your journey from, from where you've been, what you've gone through to now, and even as long as I've known you in those four years, like you just see the progression. And that's what I want people to take away from the campaign as well. It's constant evolution. We're always learning and growing. And this thing about judgment, we're so quick to make judgment of others if it's good or bad. But unless you've walked in someone's shoes, you're on your own journey. So like you said, that microscope just needs to like yeah. turn around on yourself before you can judge. Yeah, that judgment, man, judgment and comparison. That here's the dangerous thing. I'll put this in someone's head right now and hopefully it'll change. If you judge people and want and and like to feel a little better than that person, you're equally or more so susceptible to comparison and knowing that that person is better than you and that you're worse. Ah oh, Oh, I'm, oh, look at that. I never do that. They shouldn't do that. I bet within the same hour or the same day, you're going to go, oh, look at that. I don't have that. I can't get that. And you're just going to be stuck in this terrible state of limbo of who you're better than and who you're not good enough, you know, and how you're not good enough. So the next time you judge somebody, just know, uh oh, that means I'm going to be crippled and smacked in the face with the terrible, you know, curse of comparison. I don't have a Bentley. I don't have a Maybach. I don't have a nice house. I don't have the, oh, their hair is bad. Their face is bad. I have pimples. Like, don't judge because you are going to be the judge of yourself too. If you're a judgmental person towards others, it usually means you're very judgmental towards yourself too. And that's a, a good way to stop the cycle. If you stop looking at people that you're better than or putting people down or, or gossiping or talking about people, you're going to be less likely to compare yourself to other people who are better than you and feel like crap. Totally true. Totally true. So if there's anybody listening, so I've just got two questions for you. And um, 
if there's anybody listening throughout all your journey, throughout everything you've learned, take away the career, just Jeremy as Jeremy, growing as a man, from a boy to a man, what would you say to anybody when you first, you went through your issues, your struggles, you kept them to yourself, trying to take it all on, and then you unloaded it and let people know, if there's anyone struggling, what would you say to them to actually reach out for help, what you've learned on your journey? Well, you know, we've, we've talked about this. It seems to be a reoccurring theme for, for the campaign um, and for all, all people, you know, that we are only as sick as our secrets, right? And that the process of getting open, getting honest, and finding solution, right? Because another thing we've talked about a lot is, is that, um, that people like myself, like you, um, who struggle with uh, emotional, mental uh, trauma, mental disorders, um, that we, we suffer from what's called terminal uniqueness. And that alone, and alone, we are very, very weak. There's no doubt about it. If you are alone, you are weak, right? And it's deadly to feel alone, to be alone, and to keep those secrets, you know? And, you know, it's, it's, it's like an instrument, you know? When you pick up an instrument and play it, if you've never played a violin, it's probably going to be terrible right? So the first person you open up to might not be the, the amazing white light experience you're hoping for, you know, but you have to practice. You have to tell somebody and you might be like, whoa, gosh, uh, that was terrible. It sounded, you know, I, that was the wrong person to tell, <laughs> randomly tell the grocery store clerk, but hey, I tried. You know, and you'd be like, I'm maybe I need to talk to somebody who's a little more understanding and you get into this routine and habit of, of talking to people and, 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 you know, sharing our shortcomings, you know, don't die from terminal uniqueness. You're not alone. There are other people who share very similar experiences who are overcoming them little by little or in, in amazing ways, you know, and you might, you might just get on that breadcrumb trail and and find a little bit of relief and a little bit of like we talked about comparison and we talked about judgment being so deadly you know that's that's very isolating you know what we need is unity what we need is to to come together to to bond together and be like oh my gosh really really you do that too you have a nice job you know you you have a family how do you do it how do you keep your family and you know suffer with this depression or how do you keep your family and suffer with this ocd or this anxiety well i w did this and i found this place and i tried this and you know i do these meditations or w there's so many there's really there's a billion problems out there, right? And, and there's only a handful of sol the solutions. So it's not hard to find solution. There's not a million different solutions to one problem. There's, there's usually five to 10 solutions for the vast amount of problems. And one of those solutions is definitely connection, feeling part of a group of people who are overcoming on a daily basis, these struggles. And it sounds, you know, it sounds, uh, it sounds a little cliche, you know, people go to support groups or, you know, I'm going to go to my support group tonight. And, um, but they can be so, so, so high, highly beneficial, you know, and these support groups, a lot of times get a bad rap. Oh, I don't want to just sit around and listen to people talk about their problems, but your mind's like a parachute. It works best when it's open. So go with an open mind and listen for the similarities, not the differences. I would highly recommend people, even now with Zoom, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to like walk into a room full of people who, you know, have gambling problems or you walk into a room full of people who cut. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's groups for all of this stuff. You know, self-mutilation is, is a real uh, mental disorder and, and, we, uh, and it can be addressed. And you might be too ashamed to rock into a group full of people and, and have people tell gory stories about how they cut themselves or share your own gory story of how you cut yourself. I mean, this is, it's, it's, 
it needs to happen. It must happen, but it might be hard to start. So now with Zoom, you can log on. You don't even have to have your camera on and you can just listen and find that breadcrumb trail. Start small, start sharing, you know, start listening maybe first, finding some similarities, not differences, feeling a little less alone, and then maybe, you know, check in. Hey, I'm just, I'm, I'm here just listening. You don't have to tell a gory story, you know, regardless of what it is, whether it's, you know, body dysmorphia, um, anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, it doesn't really matter, but you can find a support group and listen and then maybe check in or shoot, share your first time, lay it all on the table. Might as well just get the job over with, right? Get right, jump into the deep end and start swimming because you will find people who are, are willing to share solution on how they, they've overcome their problems. Amazing. So with, with us coming just over 18 months now with the IPC, with what you've done and gone even deeper on yourself, does the term imperfectly perfect mean something different to you or deeper? What does it mean to you now? Um, you know, letting go of perfection and striving for progress. You know, each, each one of us are very much like a snowflake, all beautiful, all different, all created for a reason and for a purpose. Right. I deeply believe that. And I, a lot of people don't, but I have to, I'd have to guess that the people who don't believe that they were created for a purpose, um, I'd have to guess those people are not involved in, in being the change. I, I bet the people who don't believe they're created for a purpose are not in, involved in a, a support group who are, are not in, uh, in therapy, who are not sharing their truth. Um, they're the people that are keeping the secrets, man, the, the people that are comparing and judging, you know, and when you stop doing that and you, and, and you start paying attention to the similarities, um, not the differences, uh, you'll realize that making progress on a daily basis, one day at a time, doing a little bit better, getting a new routine. Maybe it's that gratitude list in the morning. You know, maybe it's that phone call to somebody else that, you know, is, is struggling or suffering. Um, maybe it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, creating a, a spiritual, um, hygiene routine, you know, prayers, meditations. Um, you know, when you start doing that stuff, you start going, wait a minute, maybe I was created for a purpose. You know, maybe I can do, maybe I can impact somebody. Maybe I can change my family dynamic. You know, family dynamics are big, man. If you're out there right now listening and you suffer from any mental disorder issue, mental health issue, I promise you don't have a perfect family because we mess our whole families up or we got this stuff from our families, you know, but a family is like a Rolex watch. If you take one of the gears out, the whole thing doesn't work. So if your family dynamic is all screwed up, if you just change you, you won't believe how much different that dynamic starts to work. It. You know, it's, family is a great example of how easy it is to focus on other people. Well, my mom, you don't understand. My dad is, he's an alcoholic. He abused me, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. He just angry. My, my, you know, uh, my sister's the smart one and she gets all the love. And there's, there's just so many rationalizations, justifications, and excuses that we all come up with to not change, right? To, to be like, hey, my family isn't perfect, but maybe I can be a little better today, you know? And, and that's what I think imperfectly perfect maybe means to me today is that it, in an imperfect world, just for today, if I can be away from my own shortcomings. If I can do the work and make progress in my own issues, that's perfect. That's as perfect as you can do it for one day to avoid falling into depression, to avoid giving into impulses to, you know, maybe for some people it's like not touching the doorknob 20 times and, or, or having to wash their hands every 10 minutes. If you can, you know, 
eat your meal without washing your hands 20 times today, say, screw it, I'm just going to do it, it feels scary and terrible, then that's a perfect day. So in an imperfectly world just for today, we can achieve perfection. Wow, wow. Perfect answer, mate. Perfect answer. <laughs> so, you know what? Um, I just want to thank you, like, for everything you've done for this and being a part of the team, mate. Like, you, you, you're the most... Ever since I met you and, and kept this, this friendship going, the most humblest down to earth, just give yourself so much to other people through your content, through just picking up the phone to people. And um, yeah, I just want to thank you for everything you do for everyone, to be honest with you. Amazing, man. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I doubt myself often. Um, you know, I fall prey to, uh, to depression and, uh, you know, just anhedonia that, that what's the point, you know, I might not be stuck in bed all day, although that has happened to me throughout my life for periods of time, you know, but some days just like, Oh, what's the point? I, I can't do it today. Um, and you know, I, I move anyway. I, I do it anyway, even though I think it's not going to work, even though I think it's not going to help. You know, that's why I go to the gym every day. That's why I try to eat healthy. That's why, that's why I do my laundry and make my bed. That's why I get up in the morning and I text 14 people, you know, a daily message, um, you know, anyway, mm. move anyway, you know, it, where your, where your body goes, your mind will follow. So even if your head's not there, just put your body in those places. Go through with the action, even if it doesn't connect up there yet, because the head will eventually follow. Very true. And where can people find out more information and any of your upcoming projects? Man, just jump on Instagram, at Jeremy Jackson Fitness. Uh, give me a follow. Give me a message. I'm pretty active on there. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook. However, the Instagram is the one that I check most. And, uh, you know, come down to California. Let's go to the beach together. I'll go for a training session with this man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need to get back down to goals with Igor. Um, that, was, that was a good session. Um, but guys, for anybody that's listening, I'll put all the links up to Jeremy. Please remember to subscribe, like, and share the podcast episode and all the latest episodes. Um, and guys, just remember, keep having the hard conversations because it's the hard conversations like these that will start saving lives. So until next time, guys, we will check you then.